Welcome, everybody. I'm Helen DeKaiser with the League of Women Voters of Weston, and I am delighted to see you all here. I hope that those of you in the back would consider moving forward. We have a great opportunity here to learn more about a really in-depth look and have an in-depth look at what has been going on over many, many decades, truly, to develop the situation in which Connecticut finds itself. So we're really delighted to have the Connecticut Mirror's Keith Faniff here today, able to discuss this in depth. He's been a state budget investigative reporter for a long time and has lots to say, and then your questions will bring out more. We are a nonpartisan organization, so any candidate who is here today will not ask a question. And I am going to introduce Bruce Putterman, who's the publisher of the Connecticut Mirror, so that he can let you know a little bit of background, which you also have a flyer for his um, online only newspaper. And then he will in turn introduce Keith and give you more about Keith's background. But first, I want to introduce Laura Smith, who's on the League of Women Voters of Connecticut State Board and involved with voter service to tell you about our own local program, which is coming up on October 13th, right here in this, actually it's across the street in Town Hall, but it is on the 13th of October, and it's for the 135th, but she's going to tell you about other things to do with the League, and then in turn, we'll turn it over to Bruce. Good morning. Good to see everyone here. Uh, one of the things that the League of Women Voters of Connecticut is focusing on this year is turnout. Um, some of you may know that 46% of eligible voters did not vote in the 2016 election, and that's kind of pretty dismal for a presidential. I mean, Weston doesn't have that problem. We get like 92% on a presidential. It's very impressive, although 2016, I think it was only about 75%, which is unusual for Weston. Anyway, what we want to do is make sure that if you are registered, I'm assuming a lot of you are registered, that's why you're here, but if you know a college student who might need an absentee ballot, if you have neighbors or friends who might need a ride to the polls, please encourage them to find one or offer one yourself. And we also have some important, um, these are little timelines that are in the back on your way out. It's a little calendar of when things happen, deadlines. Registration deadline is October 30th, a week before the election but you can register on election day, which is a Connecticut thing, and we're lucky to have that in our state, but it does take time, so people need to understand there might be a waiting period. We also have a how to choose a candidate. This is especially good for new, newly registered people or just kids, anyone who doesn't really understand how to navigate the various media that we have now, including social media. And we have a new guide to government, which is an updated version of how Connecticut government works, how a law becomes a bill, that's what we do, education. And I also want to talk about, there are two events coming up that are multi-town events. Uh, one is on 1016, it is in Wilton, and it will have, uh, it's a Tuesday on 1016, a candidate forum. It will feature Tony Boucher and Will Haskell at seven o'clock, so I would check, seven, 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 seven thirty. And this is at the Middlebrook Middle School in Wilton as well as Laviel Thomas and O'Day Tartell. So that's a multiple candidate forum. And on the 21st, which is a Sunday, we'll have the fourth congressional district um, debate at the Clune Center in Wilton. Weston will be participating, as will Norwalk, Reading, um, Westport, a bunch of leagues, all in the fourth congressional district. So I encourage you to do that one. That starts at 4 p.m. until 5.30. So uh, please go out, vote, make sure everybody turns out on election day. Thank you very much. All right, good morning, everybody. Um, do I need, I need to stand back here so you guys can pick this up? Is that right? All right? I hate having a podium between me and people I'm speaking with. But anyway, my name is Bruce Putterman. I am the publisher of the Connecticut Mirror. What publisher means is I am not a journalist. Um, so I'm largely the business side of the Mirror. Um, broad strategy and marketing and promotion and revenue generation. So the Connecticut Mirror, as um, Helen mentioned, and as you may have seen in the materials, is a nonprofit, nonpartisan, online-only news organization. We have been publishing every day since 2010, and um, we cover public policy, government, and politics in the state of Connecticut. We focus on state budget, 
healthcare, education, environment, uh, and politics. And um, we are a small organization. There are, in fact, when I ask people, how many, how many people do you think work at the Connecticut Mirror? People say, oh, you know, I don't know, 12, 15, 20. We have nine people at the Mirror, including me. So we have eight journalists, uh, an editor, a data editor, and six reporters. And um, so the question is, why do we do what we do? There's lots of other newspapers in the state of Connecticut. Well, philosophically, we believe fundamentally that journalism is necessary to inform the public about public policy so they understand, so the public understands um, who to vote for, what policies to engage with in terms of their own advocacy, holding government accountable. And all of those activities, those tasks are essential for a thriving democracy. So, Maybe this sounds a little grandiose, but we believe that journalism is fundamental for a thriving democracy. That is particularly true in this era of the last 10 or so years where media has contracted and fragmented and is increasingly not trusted. And the mirror has kind of run counter to that trend. In the eight and a half years since we've been publishing, we have, I dare say, uh, become the most trusted brand for information about state government in Connecticut. I know today is not a fundraiser for us, but I do just want to point, and I'm not going to ask anybody for any money, but I do want to point out that 10% of our revenue is um, from advertising and selling our content to other newspapers in the state. All of the rest of our revenue is contributed income, either from individuals or in some cases from, from foundations. <clears throat> uh, I, I do want to re reiterate one thing that Helen said, which was we, because we're a nonprofit, we have to, and because we have our own sense of journalistic ethics, um, we can't be perceived as being part of any kind of a partisan event. So if anybody here is an elected official, uh, we ask that you not ask any questions um, during the event. Keith would be happy to talk with you afterwards. Um, we just need to avoid any sense of being aligned or an excuse for some sort of a partisan kind of uh, expression of opinion. So with that, I'd like to introduce Keith. Keith Faniff uh, has been our state budget reporter from the very beginning, or a few days after the very beginning, uh, which means January or February of 2010. Um, he, he is widely regarded as the expert on the state budget in the state of Connecticut. Some people um, have even joked, uh, present company aside, that Keith knows more about the budget than a lot of legislators. Um, he is the go-to person. Um, and you may have seen an announcement yesterday, by the way, that Hearst, so the big newspaper chain down here, has uh, started, is going to buy our content, take our content. Um, a large part of the reason that newspapers all over the state take our content is because they want Keith Faniff's expertise on, on the budget. And so with that, uh, enjoy the show. I've heard this speech a dozen times. I learn something every single time I hear it. Uh, you will be mesmerized, if not a little bit depressed, but uh, mostly, <laughs> mostly mesmerized. And so with that, Keith Faniff, thank you very much. Uh, unlike Bruce, I don't mind having a podium between me and the people that I'm going to talk to. Um, if you had to cover the topic I have to, you'd want more than a podium. <laughs> Is it bulletproof? Um, let's not test. I, I've actually been doing these types of talks now for about five or six years. And I've gotten to a point where I'm, I, I kind of feel like the Rolling Stones or something. Someone will come up to me and say, oh, I, you know, I heard your talk in Darien five years ago when I was pregnant. You know, my daughter's in kindergarten now. I, I want to stop before, you know, 20 years from now, someone comes up and says, yeah, my mom saw you give a talk <laughs> 20 years ago in Weston. Um, but I do feel like the, these talks are evolving some because 
Um, if you don't mind, I'm just curious. Has anyone here heard me give a speech before not counting Bruce? Okay, I mean, I've, I've talked for a while now about what the mirror has termed our legacy of debt. And I'm not gonna ignore that, but I'm gonna cover it a little more quickly than I normally do because I really do believe the sticker shock is wearing off the state of Connecticut. They understand now that there was a problem that developed over 70 or 80 years. Some people can recite it, they come back, they know, they know my jokes, they know my analogies that I use to describe it. Um, I'm not gonna say that there's perfect acceptance of the problem. And, and I don't say that with any judgment. It's still very difficult when people hear that we had this fiscal culture of effectively mailing bills to our children and grandchildren that for decades, for generations, state government would hire public sector employees, use their services, and basically arrange the system so that when those employees retired, that generation's government would say, go to the taxpayers' kids and grandkids, and they'll pay you for your retirement. We'll use the services and our kids will pay the retirement. And every generation mailed a larger bill than it had inherited from the one that came before them. But I want to quickly go over that because the one place where I feel like Connecticut is still, again, understandably, struggling to accept it is not the concept, but the scope of the problem. Sort of another way to say it is, you know, or you really just think you know how bad it is. So with a quick refresher course, basically from 1939 until the mid 1980s, the state of Connecticut saved nothing for the benefits that it promised to state employees and municipal school teachers. When I'm talking in the case of state employees, we're talking about a pension and retirement health care for teachers there is a small supplemental health care program, but we're basically talking about a pension. And uh, you know, the, the actuaries in the room are already going to know this, but when we, when we come up with the idea of a pension, people a lot smarter than me start running the numbers. And they say, OK, we're hiring Jane Doe as a teacher, and we calculate she's going to work for 30 years, and then she's going to retire, and she's going to live for another 20 years. And if we set aside X amount of dollars for every year she's on the job, and if Jane sets aside some money every year for all the years she's on the job, and if the state treasurer takes that money and invests it every year and reinvests the investment earnings and so on and so on, by the time Jane Doe retires, the money will all be there to take care of her until she passes on. That's the concept behind it. The problem is, that wasn't the system Connecticut followed when it came for paying for it. Again, from 1939 to 1984, we saved nothing or next to nothing. There was a stretch from the early 70s where we started saving, but it was a very small amount. Then from 1984 to 2010, we began to address the problem in relative terms more seriously, but I suspect we're not grading on the curve and the state would still routinely raid its pension contributions. When it comes to retirement health care, we set aside nothing until 2009. So what that means is you'll hear people say, OK, the state has $80 billion in unfunded liabilities, and the majority of them are retirement benefits. But what it really means is that we left billions of dollars of potential investment earnings on the table. We passed up on them. I'm just you know, picking a year when 1985 shortchanged the contribution to the teacher's pension, maybe by 50 or $60 million. That problem echoes out into enormous numbers a decade, two decades, three decades later. And what we're really dealing with is approximately a 15-year period, which may become longer if we stretch out how we handle the problem where we're dealing with a group of public sector retirees and senior workers who worked at a time when the governors and legislatures who oversaw the pension system saved incredibly irresponsibly. And I'm not trying to be ghoulish, but until this group passes on, Connecticut is, is, excuse me, is in for extreme fiscal pain. 
that die is largely cast. That's not an argument for not trying to mitigate it. Bruce has heard this joke many times, and I, I told someone at the start of this, the problem is when things are, are at, a, at a really bad point, I can't promise you a good root canal, okay? <laughs> I, I hope you have enough Novocaine, not too much to make you sick. I hope, you know, your dentist, I hope she, he or she is very good at what they do. But if you say to me, I want a positive root canal, I don't have a talk for you here. And that is the hardest part for Connecticut to accept. Because it sounds like when I'm saying the die is cast, I'm saying throw your hands up, walk away, and just accept it. No, I'm not. But I am saying if you dig in and say, I want a situation where we do not go through an extremely painful situation, I don't have that for you. So how bad can it be? Because I, I, another, another analogy that I use is I sometimes think when people hear this talk, it's kind of like I want you to imagine that your spouse came home and said, hey, I feel horrible. I went to the casino. I ran up $40 million in debt. And while we're, while we're making up a hypothetical, imagine you live in a world without personal bankruptcy. And your spouse says, it's going to change how we live forever for the rest of our lives. Your initial reaction may be, hell no. Get back to the casino. Tell them you had no right to run up that debt. I'm not accepting this. And again, I get that type of reaction. But to a certain extent, that's what we're faced with now. I need to know, and I hope you do have a lot of questions. Um, we're going to leave plenty of time for that. After you get past that, or after you've acknowledged that feeling of indignation, righteous indignation, what do we do next? Because we are, again, talking about problems that, to the large extent, were created by folks who are not in state government. Some of them are not even with us anymore. How bad can it be? Well, here's one way to think about it, other than saying a number that doesn't make a lot of sense, $80 billion in unfunded liabilities. I want to talk for just a minute about just four line items in the state budget. Just four, OK? And these are not even all our fixed costs, just what I would call our hard and soft debt costs, our annual contribution to the teacher's pension, our annual contribution to the state employee's pension, our annual contribution to retirement health care, not, not health care for people who are actually working, retirement health care benefit. And the last of the four debt items is payments on bonded debt. We issue bonds on Wall Street if we're going to help towns build a new school, renovate a school, um, fix state buildings, preserve farmland and open space, sometimes do some pork barrel projects. Those four line items <clears throat> 20 years ago ate up about 12% of the general fund. I say, think of them as crabgrass. You have a nice rectangular backyard, and wherever this crabgrass, you can't use the yard. That's our budget. It was crabgrass in 12% of the yard two decades ago. Now it's crabgrass is in about one third of the entire yard. And wherever something else was situated that now is crabgrass, what was there has to get out of the yard. So what it's doing, and we'll, we'll get into this a little bit more, is it's leaching resources out of the rest of the budget. It's already been doing it. It's taking it out of higher education, transportation, social services, municipal aid. Believe me, it has been going on, and it is projected to intensify over the next 15 years or longer. You are just entering this period. Again, people will say, well, how, how bad can that be? These four line items have been, for the most part, growing by about 10% a year. OK? And, and I, will, I will go back to that. Because of this situation, though, people want to say, well, there's got to be some, there's got to be some way out of this. What can we do? And, and um, the first one I'm going to do is, to, I'm sorry, I'm going to shoot some holes in some of the things people are looking for. Some people are saying, well, I want to get concessions from workers. I'm not taking a position. I'm not saying you shouldn't do that. What I am saying is that 
is not going to solve the problem in a, in a significant amount. That's not an argument not for doing it. Many times you say it's important just to send the message. It's just like uh, if, if you had three feet of water in your basement and I showed up with a hand sponge and I said, I want to go into your basement and I want to take a couple spongefuls of water out. I didn't make your problem worse. You go to town, Keith, knock yourself out, get carpal tunnel, do as many as you want. And when I leave, I didn't make your problem worse. But I didn't bring a tool that actually deals with the problem. 85% of the money that we're going to contribute this year to the state employees pension system and 85% of the money that we're going to contribute to the teacher's pension system is to cover the sins of the fiscal past. It's not about that setting aside money for the present day workers so that when they retire, the money's there. Another way to say that is if every state employee and teacher on the job today stormed the Capitol and demanded you cancel their pensions for the good of the state, and you hold on to the money that they've paid in interest-free until they retire, you would still have an incredibly tough road to hoe. I don't, again, I don't say that. I want to emphasize this because so many people just hear, uh, try to hear a motive and not the fact. I'm not saying this is why you should or should not say concessions are important. I'm simply saying that is not a major step in terms of whittling down the problem because the people who we owe the money to are already off the job for the most part. And you can't bargain with them and you can't negotiate with them. So let's talk about growing our way out. That's a very popular solution that people offer. If you want to grow your way out, you have to look at the state income tax because 51% of our budget is paid for by the income tax, okay? It, we have a $20.8 billion budget, but I want you to focus on a $19 billion general fund because that covers the bulk of the operating costs. We'll, we'll put transportation, we'll put a pin in that for now, okay? 51% of that general fund is paid for by the income tax. And our income tax is different from other states because of our proximity to Wall Street. About two-thirds of our income tax comes from paycheck withholding, but the other one-third comes from quarterly filings, which are dominated by capital gains, dividends, and other investment earnings. This, more than anything else in good times, was the economic engine that pumped money into the state's coffers. And by the way, just as a quick aside, the income tax in Connecticut really goes back much earlier than 1991. For two decades before that, Connecticut imposed a tax on capital gains, dividends, and interest if you made enough of them. It was a tax on the wealthy. We used to actually tax capital gains at 7%. We taxed dividends at 14%. Those all got rolled into the standard income tax, and actually the rate was cut when we passed the income tax in 1991. If you think about the fact that this is the area, like I said, that, that grows rapidly, just think about this. I'm going to give you a couple four-year stretches. Between 1995 and 1999, and again between 2004 and 2008, this segment of our revenue stream grew by almost 20% on average a year. It's not an exaggeration. One stretch, it was 19%, another it was 23 When it boomed, it boomed really well. The problem is, since the so-called Great Recession, we had only one year of positive double-digit growth until this year. This year, it boomed. For the first time in a long time, it really boomed. There's still a lot of debate among economists, though, of whether it's going to continue to do that. Some people say... There were, some, there were some anomalies that may not repeat. Some people made extra tax payments in, at the end of 2017 to take advantage of the outgoing federal income tax system. And that also therefore affected what they pay into the state. Um, there were some changes in federal law about the repatriation of offshore hedge fund holdings. So the point is, we really haven't had this period of year after year where the state income tax is doing like it did during the good times in the 80s, the 90s, and the 2000s.
but let's say for argument's sake, it will again. <clears throat> let's say we get that surge. We're now talking about adding five or six hundred million dollars a year to the state budget. You've got that money. You ready? Watch for it. Pension costs growing 10% a year. Debt costs growing 10% a year. Anyone know what 10% of $5 billion is? $500 million. The minute you have your great performing economy, the bill collectors at the door going yoink, and the bills grow year after year for the next 15 years. Right now, one could make an argument, this is an example of good economic times because we have seen our income tax receipts surge over the last year. And nonpartisan analysts still say, without adjustments, state finances will run, they will outspend revenues by about $2 billion in the first year after the election. And then it grows by about five to 600 million a year each year after that. So what can we do? We've, we've already said the problem with saying, well, I wanna grow the way out of the economy. I wanna keep taxes flat. We're gonna get this money in. We already know the bills that our parents and grandparents ran up are growing faster than probably the best economy we ever had. And they're just getting started. We know if we go into recession, by the way, that's the other problem with our income tax. When it's great, it booms, and when the, when the recessions hit, it plunges. Those deficit numbers I gave you, make them one to two billion dollars worse per year if, and I'm not an economist, I'm not predicting when, if we go into recession. Because the capital gains part of our revenue stream drops off the grid when that happens. I will point out though, our last bear market was April of 2009. History suggests we're closer, whenever it is, to the next recession than we are to the next really prolonged period of booming economy. But I, 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 again, I want to stress, your guess is as good as mine when that next recession is. So what else can we do? Well, since about 2016, the state has been trying to take more of an austerity approach. Remember, we've already said that this, this legacy of debt is leaching resources out of the budget. The problem also is so much of our budget is locked in. You got about 30% of the budget we talked about tied up in this debt. 15% in Medicaid. We still haven't paid a state employee yet. You've got about 15 to 20% there. So that leaves you really just three pots of money, about the remaining 35 to 40% in the budget to make cuts. Municipal aid, that used to be about as sacred a cow as they get in the state budget. Public colleges and universities, by the way, it already costs about 30 to 40% more to go to the community colleges, the state universities in Yukon than it did when we first came out of the Great Recession in 2010. And social services and non-Medicaid programs. So I wanna just talk for a minute about these and, and, and see if people say, well, what more can we take? We kind of addressed higher education. I mean, you can, but how much more expensive do you wanna make it? We've already shifted a big cost of this legacy of debt and we're still in the early stages of dealing with it. Some people say that crabgrass in the backyard, okay, by the mid to late 2020s, is gonna be eating up half the yard. Who followed the situation with Hartford and bankruptcy in the papers? I assume most people watched it. Okay. Everybody knows that the state has programs to help communities that host state property, colleges, hospitals, and traditionally, all of these are located 
in urban centers. The reason you have a hospital in an urban center, if possible, not there are always exceptions, but the reason you try to have them in the center of populated areas is so everyone can get to them quickly. Same thing with colleges and universities. Okay, we set up this, pay, this program, most people have probably heard of PILOT. It's an acronym for payment in lieu of taxes. By the way, if you see me checking my phone, it's, it's not because I've got to hurry. It's because I don't want Helen to have to come up here with a hook and pull me off if I go over my time. Um, pilot for colleges and hospitals, when it was set up, was supposed to give communities back some. We never were giving them back all, but some of the money they lost. Because the state says to the cities and towns, you can't tax these colleges, you can't tax these hospitals. We're not going to give you back all the money you lose, but we'll give you back 77 cents on a dollar. That didn't last that long, but it's really been deteriorating over the last decade. In 2010, we were already only giving them 43 cents in a dollar. Now it's down to 23 cents. While I'm telling you this, keep in mind, 51% of the city of Hartford's land is exempt from taxation. Excuse me, 51% of its grand list, or potential grand list, I should say, of its, of its property value, 51%. You used to give them 77 cents in a dollar for colleges, started the decade at 43 cents, down to 23. State land was supposed to be 45. The start of the decade, 28 cents in a dollar, now 14 cents on the dollar. That's a loss to communities, primarily to the cities, from the beginning of the program to now, using present dollars, they're losing about 320 million if we just funded pilot like we did when we started it. You can say whatever, I'm not taking a position on the management of the city of Hartford, but I will tell you is you literally gave them what you were giving them when the program began. They would be fiscally solvent right now. I promised Helen I would cover this part. How many people have heard Rhode Island seemed to get out of all of these problems? Has anyone heard that? Rhode Island, what, why can't we do in Connecticut what they did in Rhode Island? This is the part that gets me run out of more of these talks. I need like, seriously, like on my iPod, I need like some, some banjo getaway music to play as I'm driving out of town while the cars are following me. Um, I'm sorry. You can't rely on the Rhode Island example because Connecticut and Rhode Island are outliers in the exact opposite direction. Rhode Island is one of the few states in the nation that promised none of its retirement benefits contractually. They're all statutory. Okay, so they had all kinds of leverage when state employees said, hey, wait a minute, what are you doing? Your Honor, they can't reduce my benefits. The judge said, I'm sorry, sir, you don't have a contract, you have a statute. Connecticut, right now, has all of its major retirement benefits programs affected by contract. And let me explain, because someone might say, no, they don't with teachers. Yes, they do. We'll take the easy one first, state employee pension and state employee retirement health care. We bargain collectively both for the benefit and how we're going to save for it, which does mean that when we shortchanged the state employee pension fund from the mid-80s on, we did so with the agreement of the unions. If you're really going to tell the full story, though, you should also point out that the unions agreed while we held a gun to our head and said, let us do this or we're going to lay off 5,000 of your members or however many. But nonetheless, the unions did go along with it. The problem with the teachers goes back to 2008. That pension fund was so poorly funded. I mean, both of these are really cash poor, which is one of the reasons why we get such crummy investment returns some years, because we have to keep so much of the money liquid. If I give you a ton of cash, but only three days to get me a good investment return, and when you bring it back, I go, why'd you invest it in this local savings bank account? So well, you gave me three days, what did you expect? The teacher pension was so bad, we borrowed $2 billion in 2008. By the way, we borrowed it at a little over 5.8% for 25 years under the hope, just before we went into recession, by the way, that we'd get an 8.5% return on the pension investments. So far, that hasn't quite worked out. 
but we promised our pension investors in the bond covenant, the contract between the state of Connecticut and the people who bought our bonds, that we would not alter the actuarially required contribution until the bonds are defeased, until they're paid off. Some of them are still not even callable. The projection is we will not be done, we will not be in a position legally or fiscally to pay off the bonds until 2024, 2025. So we, even if you think the political will is there to start trying to reduce benefits, and again, we're only, you can only really be talking about reducing benefits for people who are on the job. You can't go to somebody, I mean, unless you can show me some um, legal research that nobody else has found, you can't go and get a retired teacher and start reducing the benefits for those already off the job, which is where the bulk of the money is already going. I'm always trying to mention what about what are other states doing? And I, I used to get into this in more detail, but I'll just keep it briefly. To put it bluntly, most other states are laughing at us. Most other states do not have the problem that Connecticut has. Connecticut, according to data from Moody's, has roughly three and a half times the per capita state pension debt of other states. When they did this a couple of years ago, the estimate was the national average was about $4,400 for every man, woman, and child. Connecticut's was about $14,800. Most other states did not save anywhere near as irresponsibly. Going back to my earlier analogy, if we have four feet of water in our basement, most states have one. At this point, this is the part where I, I, I do mention to people, and I usually get, I see people scribbling, this is where the questions start, where they say, well, what, when are we going to start talking about taxes? I don't think anyone would dispute taxes are a drag on the economy. Cutting government programs is a drag on the economy. And I'm not saying they're all created equal. I have no problem if somebody says, look, cutting taxes is a greater drag on the economy. We have to stop looking at this like every tool in the toolbox is available to us. The blunter way I put it is, welcome to the land if you may not have a choice. What are you gonna do when the bill collector's at the door? And the first thing people say to me is, wait, Keith, haven't you heard about the Laffer curve? What happens if I raise taxes and it brings in less money? So let's look at that. Is that what's happening right now? Does anyone, uh, somebody asked me, I can't remember, it might have been the gentleman over there, asked me how much right now we have in annual revenues and how much of them come from taxes. Right now we bring in across all our taxes, not just the income tax, all of them, about 15.9 to almost $16 billion. That's general fund tax receipts, 10 of which, by the way, roughly 10 comes from the income tax, so you can see how big that is. Um, I want to just bring it back to two points in time. Remember, think 16 billion now. In 2011, before we increased taxes the first time in the Malloy administration, it was bringing in 12 billion dollars. Okay, it was bringing in 12. It's now bringing in 16. Before the recession, 2008, it was bringing in 13. There's a difference between the Laffer curve which says, now I'm going to just use silly numbers. If my income tax brings in $10 and I raise taxes and I anticipate it's going to bring my income tax up to 15 and instead it brings it down to 9 now I've passed the Laffer curve. I'm actually getting less money by raising taxes. It's another thing if my income tax brings in $10, I approve an increase, I expect it's going to bring in five more, bring it to 15, and it only brings in three more, and it brings it to 13. This is the land that we're in right now. Economists call those diminishing returns. I'm not saying that's, that's insignificant. It's very significant. The point is, and this, this sort of leads me into our, our wealth and income inequality situation. Some people say, well, let's take a risk. Let's go to court. And let's tell a federal judge, Connecticut can't pay. Well, the first thing we cannot demonstrate with, with data, I'm not talking about political rhetoric, I'm talking about data. We cannot demonstrate 
that the wealthiest state and the wealthiest nation in the world is having its tax receipts flow backwards. Quick, quick point on wealth inequality. We know in the United States, basically from the stock market crash in 1929 until the election of President Reagan, we flow generally in the direction of wealth equality. You have advances in civil rights, collective bargaining, post-war prosperity, expansion of higher education. And then after 1980, we lost more jobs overseas. We saw some of the rollbacks in civil rights and collective bargaining. Explosions in technology replace a lot of low skilled jobs. I mean, who hasn't gone to the supermarket now and can't find a cashier? That's the pendulum in the United States. Connecticut is surfing the crest of a wave. We are ground zero for wealth and income inequality on planet Earth. And, and if, say, from 1980 to the last recession reversed all the progress or all the, all the change, I should say, the last recession sped it up. Because the reputation of Connecticut has always been, well, okay, so there is a large gap, but that's simply because the wealthy do so well here. The poor and the middle class do very well, too. In the first four years after the recession, the top 1% in the United States captured 85% of the income growth, and the bottom 99%, which includes, by the way, some very rich people, captured the other 15 in Connecticut, the top 1% captured all of the income growth. The rest, on average, lost 2%, and the numbers skew dramatically by the time you get down to the middle class, let alone to the poor. Another way to look at it is nationally, we're at a peak for, for income inequality. The top 1% earn, on average, 25 times what the bottom 99% average. Again, we're talking about some incredibly wealthy people in the bottom 99%, 25 to 1. In Connecticut, the ratio is 44 to 1. In Fairfield County, it's 77 to 1. So we're basically going to go into federal court wearing 17 tiaras and say, Your Honor, we can't pay this bill, even though our tax system is still raising more money. And again, I'm not saying tax increases are a great thing. I'm telling you, if somebody thinks a federal judge is going to say, okay, Connecticut, you don't have to pay that bill, don't worry. I think the judge is gonna say, whoever promised you, you were always gonna be more affluent than Michigan. You're not Arkansas, let alone Puerto Rico. Pay your bills and come back when you are. That, I think, is the problem that we run into if we're counting on that silver bullet solution that somebody's going to take it away. Um, I, I, I want to hurry up because I, I know we have to get to the Q&A, but some people have said to me, no, no, you're getting it wrong, Keith. The, the, the wealthy are fleeing Connecticut like never before. I know an accountant, and he told me. My new favorite oxymoron is anecdotal evidence. If you look at the census data, you can pretty much pick the year, and it will show you that the incomes of the people moving out of Connecticut are greater than the people of the incomes moving into Connecticut. I, I'm not surprised if you reduce the country to two states, Connecticut and the other 49, on a per capita basis, which one is wealthier? Connecticut. And you would expect the people moving out of Connecticut are wealthier than the people moving out of the other 49. But if that doesn't make it clear, let me give you a quick quiz. Which state has named one of the states that's been gaining the most wealth over the last 40 years? Can anyone name this powerhouse state? Arkansas. Yes. Arkansas, which la ranks last in just about every single wealth metric. Why? Well, let's reduce the United States again to two states. Arkansas. The other 49, which of the two on a per capita basis is wealthier? Odds are it's the other 49. And every single year, the odds are the people moving out of the other 49 into Arkansas will be richer than the people moving out of Arkansas into the other 49. It's not as simple as just saying that. Connecticut has never grown its wealth through migration. 
You remember earlier in the talk, I spoke to you about the capital gains tax and the dividends tax. In 1990, just before the big state income tax as we know it was passed, we taxed capital gains at 7%. We taxed dividends at 14%. In 1991, we adopted the state income tax and all types of income were taxed at one flat rate, 4.5%. For those doing the math, that was the biggest tax cut in modern Connecticut. Currently, the top marginal rate on the income tax is 6.99%. We've just gotten back to 7. And that's the top rate. You have to make over $500,000 to have that tax there. My point is, that did not produce a massive influx of wealthy people pouring into Connecticut in 1992 to take advantage of the 4.5% tax rate. And again, I don't think anybody who comes up to me and says, look, I know an accountant who knows people moving to Florida. I don't doubt that. I'm not saying this migration is a good thing. I'm not saying disregard it. What I am saying is ask yourself, where did we get our wealth from? We grew jobs in the financial services sector. We haven't been growing those jobs and we know that. Therein lies the problem. So I want to get down to the last thing because Helen's going to shoot me if I don't give you anything to leave here with any hope. Okay. The reason wealth inequality matters is because economists from the most liberal to the most conservative will tell you there is a tipping point. We're not saying everything in life has to be equal. But when unlimited in, um, inequality is not good either, you get to a point <clears throat> excuse me, where so many people are not contributing to the gross state product. So many people are instead using government resources rather than contributing to the prosperity that your economy hits a tipping point. And I'm not here today to tell you Connecticut is at that tipping point. We had a fiscal a commission, excuse me, on, on fiscal sustainability, fiscal stability, boy, that's a mouthful. Commission on Fiscal Stability and Economic Growth. That's why we called it the Patricelli Smith Commission at the Capitol. It was much easier. They issued a recommendation that was centered primarily on reducing the state income tax from 7 to 5.75%. Repeal the estate tax. They were going to replace some of it with about $750 million in sales tax increases. They were going to pay for it with corporation tax increases. So it was sort of a big tax shift, the Republicans in the legislature said, I don't like those tax hikes. The Democrats said the middle class will gain $8 a week if they don't buy too many things because the sales tax went up. And if you make over a million dollars, you'll gain $240 a week. And that didn't work for them. The last point I want to leave you with is if you're looking for hope, look in a couple places. One. We're dealing with two problems at the same time, this legacy of debt and the wealth inequality. And we already know that economists say the real danger of inequality is between the poor and the middle class. If you don't have enough people with access to education, job training, transportation, and health care, those numbers will grow. We know, or right, you know now, that this legacy of debt has been draining money out of education, transportation, health care, and other public services, and we're just beginning to deal with the legacy of debt. I think based on simple math, the way our economy grows versus our bills, and I don't think there's any silver bullet in court, that if you, you won't be able to cover your pension bills just with austerity, you'll literally start running out of cuts. If you want to preserve these other programs, you're going to have to decide if you want to raise revenue to do it, not because that will help the economy. You have to ask yourself, how can I make this a less painful root canal? Because there's no good root canal. I also like to say there's no good fall out of a third floor window. Last thing, and I want to, so I can open it up to some questions. If you want some other hope, start demanding honest answers out of your candidates for governor, out of your candidates for the legislature. And just try this experiment. Start keeping track of the promises that they offer you. 
and then watch who wins and watch how much they're delivered. We can talk if you want in the Q&A about what I call fiscal bait and switch. So many things in, in the last few years have been dangled and then taken back just before you get them. People pass tax cuts, campaign on them, and just after the election and just before they're supposed to deliver the tax relief, they take it back. Keep track of these and see how many are delivered. And if you don't have time to keep track because we're all busy, please read the mirror and we'll do it for you. Thank you. <laughs> Okay, does everybody just want me to leave? I won't be hurt, you can just say it. Um, I think the easiest way is, and I promise I'll just go one side of the room to the other. If you have a question, um, just raise your hand. Oh, I'm sorry, there's a microphone over there. So easiest way I guess would be if, if folks want to do this orderly, we'll just take turns going to the mic. Sir, go ahead and we'll go to the mic. I think I can predict my voice. No, they need it for, we're, we're recording this. I'm sorry. I'll just go quickly then. Okay, we'll go to the first lady at the mic and then we'll line Hi. up from there. Um, Andrea Chase, Hiker Road. I don't I'll, know I'll repeat the question too, so if anyone can't hear it, don't worry, I'll say it. Go ahead. I'm sorry, miss. Um, what's the impact on Connecticut of the recent federal tax cut? Okay, thank you very much. Uh, she asked what the impact was on Connecticut of the recent federal income tax cut. Um, right now, uh, first of all, I should point out, we did try to pass some measures to mitigate that. It does look like based on the new IRS regulations, Connecticut's not gonna be able um, to utilize any of them. As far as an exact number, I don't have one for you. What we're looking at though is something that's going to hit hard on the middle class. And I think quite frankly, even on the wealthy in Connecticut, because we do have the largest, I want to make sure I phrase this properly, we claim more um, deductions for state and local taxes that we pay than any other state in the country on a per person basis. Um, I've looked at projections from liberal and conservative economists that still exceeds the value of the rate cuts that were passed by the Congress. And I'm sorry, I don't have an exact projection for you as to how much the average Connecticut household would lose. Can you just do one follow up? Um, you gotta go to, the, I promise these folks we go to the mic, so. Go ahead, Tom. Okay, thanks, thanks for your remarks. Uh, you began your remarks today by noting that I think 20 years ago, 12 or 13% of the budget was consumed by fixed costs. You said that's now up to a third. Do you have a projection for where that figure is going in the next five to 10 years? Okay, thank you. If people didn't hear it, he, he was asking me about the fixed debt costs. Um, and again, I wanna just clarify, that's not all the fixed costs in the budget. Um, we have, because of a labor concessions deal and um, no layoff provisions, we have after the elections two years of 5.5% raises. We're not even talking about that cost. Um, we're not even talking about our Medicaid program, which is about $2.7 billion a year. We're just talking about the fixed debt costs. Again, we were talking about 12% of the budget 20 years ago. We're talking closer to one third now. And there are varying projections, and I'll explain why they vary, that have them by the mid to late 2020s going over 50%. We have pension systems that still rely on what some people argue are inflated discount rates, which is just jargon for the assumed rate of return on our pension investments. We assume that the pension investments for the state employee pension over a 30 year period will average a 6.9% return. For the teacher's pension, it's 8%. It used to be worse. We used to assume eight and a half for the teachers and eight and a quarter for the state employees. Um, Moody's Investor Service put out a very, it got a lot of attention, a very interesting report seven years ago now um, that tried to get the number closer to um, the rate of return on treasury notes. And they were suggesting about 5.5%. They're still higher, but that's what they were suggesting. If we don't hit those rate of returns, if we only do 5.5%, there was a study 
that said the teacher pension contribution, which is about $1.2 billion now, would quintuple by the early 2030s. By the early 2030s, that one line item in our budget would have grown from 1.2 billion a year north of 6.2 billion a year. The state employee contribution was projected on the same trajectory from about 1.2 to north of 6.6. .6. We reached an agreement, and this doesn't get, this, uh, this, this only generally gets reported part of the way, that we were gonna stretch that out we got permission from the unions to push costs right now onto the kindergarten classes all over Connecticut. Everybody reported, hey, that cost is still gonna rise. It's gonna go from 1.2 billion to about 2.2 billion, which is still a hefty increase over the next decade. And then it's gonna stabilize there for about 20 or 30 years. What they didn't mention though, is we did that by shifting $14 billion till after 2032, and we added several billion dollars to the cost. How? If you have a mortgage, you can't get a better rate, but you need more time, you can't make the payment. And you go to the bank and the bank says, fine, I'll extend the payments. We'll, we'll do it over a longer period of time. But you're gonna end up paying more money in the long run. That's what we basically did with the pension. So anyone else? Please. Yes, um, yes, sir. You mentioned that, I think you said next year we're gonna hit a $2 billion deficit spending. Um, and then the, every year after that, it's gonna grow by 500, bill, 500 million. So in mm -hmm. year two, it'll be two and a half billion. Year three, it'll be three billion. So in effect, um, we go from 10% of budget, that'll just keep growing to a bigger, bigger percentage of budget deficit spending. Okay. Thank you, I'll, I'll, I'll repeat that and I'll explain, but your, your numbers are basically correct. What, what, the projection we have from nonpartisan analysts, and if people didn't hear, is this gentleman was asking about the growth. What are these, they call them in budget terms, the out years. Why does the state budget outlook seem to be getting progressively worse year after year? What the analyst said was in a $19 billion general fund in the first fiscal year after the election, that's the fiscal year that begins this coming July, it's the budget the new governor must present to the legislature in February. It's also the new budget that whoever wins the governor's race has to start working on the day after the election. Analysts say if we don't make changes to our current system, they take into account economic trends, what's likely to grow, they take into account um, changes that have already been enacted into law in different programs, they look at caseload for social services, they say if you don't make any changes, that budget will spend two billion more than it brings in, which is about a 10% gap. And then they say, what if hypothetically, we don't deal with the problem, let's go another year out. What happens then? It grows to 2.6 billion. One year after that, 3.2. One year after that, 3.7. And someone might say, well stop it Keith, and you'll hear the political candidates say this, no one's gonna let it go that far. Of course, we're gonna deal with it the first year. So if I have $2 billion in solutions next spring, the legislators come in, the governor comes in, and they will make something up. They make $2 billion in programmatic cuts. Now that deficit is solved, and the $2.6 billion deficit in the second year is down to already to 600 million because those programmatic cuts are gonna save money not just one year, year after year after year, it's not so bad. It is so bad for two reasons. One, you can see that we're still adding on a hefty amount, most of which is being provided by that legacy of debt. So we're always having a new target just pushed a little farther ahead and a little farther ahead. Here's the other problem. In modern history, no governor or legislature has dealt with a billion dollar plus problem, all with what the economists call recurring solutions. If I raise taxes, that's a recurring solution, whether it's a good one or a bad one, tax brings in money year after year. If I cut a program, whether you think it's a smart cut or a dumb cut, it brings the savings year after year after year. That's a recurring solution and the politicians can fight about which are the best ones to use. However, what if I tap the rainy day fund? Got a billion dollars in the reserve. 
and I'll just give you a hypothetical. I take that billion dollars and I use that to help me in that first budget right after the election. I put that $1 billion into the problem. Now my $2 billion holes become a $1 billion hole. And I close the rest with cuts. But that's like filling a pothole with snow. In spring, you've got a problem. That $1 billion is used up. You only got to use it once. It doesn't roll out. It doesn't help you the year after that where the problem was 2.6. I only did a $1 billion in true cuts. The rest I paid for ongoing programmatic expenses with a one-time block of money. That has been the story of Connecticut in modern state history. Budgets generally with big projected deficits are riddled with one-time solutions. And you might say, well, great, we don't seem to run out of them. Trust me, that's the problem. We're getting to the point where we're running out of piggy banks to raid. You mentioned an uh, $80 billion. Uh, on only because there are some more, uh, more folks, sir. Uh, I promise I'll stick around, but I want to give as many people as I can a chance. So could you just explain further how and why in the richest state of the nation this legacy of debt mm -hmm. and unfunded liabilities was a, created or allowed to grow over the past decades? Okay, thank you. I, I, I want to just repeat that because this lady, thank you, asked my favorite question. <laughs> how did this happen? How did this legacy of debt happen in this uber wealthy state? Now. I'm 54, so I was born in 1964. I can't speak to what happened to 39 like, from the perspective of somebody who was there. But you can look at the problem, and I think, honestly, Connecticut has always seen, to a certain extent, and I'll, and I'll, I'll, I'll back this up with some data. It won't just be uh, won't me opining up here. Um, has looked to a certain extent at Fairfield County and its financial services sector is a bottomless well. Um, the pension program started, they call it pay as you go, which by the way is a horrible name because it's the exact opposite of pay as you go. They would hire people and like I said, set aside nothing. For decades, we didn't save a penny because government was smaller, salaries were smaller, pensions were smaller, and the pension wasn't a big line item and it built over time. But the point is when people realized in the 80s it was becoming a problem, they set up this pension fund, the idea of, okay, we're gonna prepay, we're gonna set aside the money while you're on the job. The folks in the mid 80s were the first ones to have to do two things. We have to catch up on the bill our parents left us and save so we don't leave our kids a bill. And they tried to do it at the same time. Think about it. this is a state that didn't have discipline to begin with and now the first generation that's gonna embrace discipline has to do double duty. They have to pay off their parents' bills and save so they don't leave one for their kids. And it was hard. It got even harder because about seven years after we started doing that, the state income tax came along and people got ticked. Everyone remember thousands of people on the Capitol lawn. We had the income tax, we had a recession, Actually, we had a recession, then we had an income tax. But when we came out of that, the first thing we did, Governor Rowland got permission from the unions to put the state employee pension system on what you would call a balloon, like a balloon mortgage schedule. And we started contributing less and less, and we, 20 years out, you know, 2015 looked far off in 1995. And that's what we started to do. We had, between 2001, two years ago, we had run up about $6 billion in surpluses during those boom times. We spent two-thirds of them. Two-thirds of them. That is why I say it points to the philosophy that it was a bottomless well. It was this idea that you know, we know we're shifting costs off, but if we ever get serious about it, we can tackle it. The money's there. The money's there. And then somebody woke up and said, whoa. This problem's growing bigger than our bottomless well has ever performed in any given year. And then people got scared. Yes, sir. Well, I understand the burden of the legacy. And I understand that you can't change that. The issue is moving forward from there. Right. Let me give you one example. I ran a company. I had 1,200 employees uh, in the greater Hartford area. 
uh, 10 years later, after I took over the company, I had 800 employees because I couldn't compete with the state, uh, especially for lower wage workers. Right. Um, let me give you one example of that. Many of the spouses work for the state. I couldn't afford, I couldn't compete with the health care plan. I paid my employees a bonus if their spouse would take the state plan. Um, I, and couple that with the five, what's a five and a half percent salary increase? No company is giving five and a half percent. Right. I mean, we have to start now changing things moving forward. I understand it may be, you know, not large compared to the burden we bear, but somehow things have to start changing. Okay. Um, say, would you mind staying at the mic for a second, sir? Um, Sorry. I can't. Would you mind staying at the microphone for a second? Sure. I just want to ask you, I'm not trying to be difficult. Um, th this is really interesting. This gentleman, if people didn't hear, was asking, he was talking about his own business experience, how when he faced some challenges, he had to downsize about a third of his staff from about 1,200 to 1,800, uh, excuse me, 1,200 to 800. And I move him to Texas. Okay, move them to Texas. <laughs> and talk about the state getting... I didn't move them. Okay, I hear I you. I hired people in Texas. Okay, got it. Let me, let me ask you then, because the problem is, is not, I'm not, I'm not the, these are making it sound like I'm saying what are, the, what are the choices I would make, and I don't mean that. What I'm saying is you have a bill collector at the door every year, and too many times in state government what people are saying is, shoot, we have a bill collector coming, and we have to cut costs. And somebody assumes, well, how hard can it be? Just cancel that TV Guide subscription. Sorry, I'm a child of the 70s, so I go to TV Guide. No one knows what that is anymore. Um, you could eliminate the state police force. Okay, eliminate it. No one here in this room would do that. That buys you one year with the problem with the teacher pension and the state employee pension. It's not the concepts that I disagree with. It's the scope of the problem. And I get it when people go, wait, there's just no way it can be that bad. Look at the numbers. If you laid off 3,000, 4,000 state employees, that gives you enough money to cover half of the problem we talked about with the growing pension costs for one year. And then if you keep them off the job, fine. You can say there's that savings year after year. You're not talking about trimming the fat. You're down to basically saying, we have a $3 billion municipal aid program and people are mad that Hartford is in bankruptcy, or excuse me, was almost in bankruptcy. You could eliminate the municipal aid program and within two years, your state budget would be in deficit because of the way these other problems are growing. What would you do to cut spending in state government? Well, I don't know enough about state government, and I'm not suggesting we can lay off a third of the uh, state employees. I'm talking about the compensation uh, that they get and the benefits they get. Now, I know that's small compared to the size of the problem, but you've got to start somewhere. Oh, no, no. I'm not arguing against starting. Remember, I, I used that bad analogy about the sponge. If I bring a sponge into your flooded basement and take a few handfuls out, I did not make your problem worse. You're just not ready to invite people over for a party in that basement either. Um, and, and thank you for the question. I, I want to just yeah, I'll try to use another example. I feel bad because I, I didn't mean to, but I, I had this caller on WNPR, and I made this lady cry, and I still get teased about it. In, in 2010 when everybody was running for governor. Back then, everyone was being asked about, you might remember, the, the, what was one of the largest projected deficits in state history, 3.7 billion. We're talking about a $2 billion problem. This was 3.7 billion, almost 20% of the general fund was gonna vanish and it was a bipartisan mess. Outgoing Governor Rell and the 2010 legislature had propped up billions of dollars of ongoing program with expiring temporary money. Governor Malloy is coming in. Every candidate, well, we didn't know he was going to win at the time, but every candidate for governor, every single one was saying, I'm going to have to get concessions from the unions. So not surprisingly, 
The union leaders, who were also elected officials, were getting grilled by the rank and file. If I vote to you, you know, for you as my union steward, what are you going to do? Are you going to say, you know, am I going to have to take a pay cut? Am I going to have to take a benefit cut? And there became a very popular mantra among the union leaders. State government is bloated with mid-level management. We have too many mid-level managers. If that's the problem, and if we get rid of them, we're fine. So I was, I was on NPR, and this lady called in, said, I have a question, I'm in a union, I've been told the problem is mid-level management. And I said, well, I'm not going to take a position on it, miss, but let's just look at that for a minute. If we got rid of every mid-level manager tomorrow, and we could lay them off right away, no notices, no anything, you could solve about 30 or $40 million of the problem. Now, the problem is $3.67 billion. So you have solved um, basically 1%. And I have 99% to go, so what else do you have? And I felt so bad because her voice started to crash. She goes, well, thanks for the information, but that's really depressing because I was counting on that. And then she hung up. I, I, I still get teased about that. I, I didn't mean to, but the point is, it's a brilliant message. It's a brilliant political message. Think about this. You don't have to take a pay cut. You don't have to have your benefits reduced. We just have to fire your obnoxious boss and everything will be fine. And people said, I'll vote for that. But nobody looked at the numbers. They had their solution for 1% of the problem. I mean, that's the type of thing that you've got to look at. I, I do, sir, I hear you, but I, I have a whole line of people, so you have to let me let this gentleman go. I hope I answered your question. I'll be happy to stick around and talk to you some more. Yes, sir. Connecticut, like Arkansas and many other states, relies somewhat on the promise of job growth or needs job growth. And we promise corporations who want to come, we try to lure corporations into our town, into our state by generous tax breaks and other incentives. My question is, is there statistical information available on how well those kinds of tax breaks work? And um, would they help, do they help, might sure. they help our deficit problems? Um, I'll, I'll thank you for the question. I'll, I'll repeat that. A gentleman was asking, because we do have a lot of situations where the state of Connecticut has provided tens or in some cases even hundreds of millions of dollars in economic development aid. Um, and he wanted to know what type of statistical data do we have to show that that worked. That's a real point of controversy right now. I think the short answer is we have very questionable data. The, the legislature passed a requirement now that the Department of Economic and Community Development has to produce an annual report that addresses this problem. There was actually a hearing in the legislature this past week because the, the state auditors of public accounts, which is a, a bipartisan office serving the General Assembly, has reported that they still have not gotten reliable data from DECD. So while I could tell you DECD says Yes, whoever's gotten our money has met all of our job quotas. The point is the auditors are saying, one, we can't confirm that, two, that's not our only question. Like you wanted to know, what type of economic modeling have we done? How much do we know that that's actually growing jobs or stimulating the economy in Connecticut? So the short answer is the legislature has started to up the pressure on that, but we haven't found a solution on that yet. Is there someone else in line? Thank you very much for this informative talk. You. you started by saying, uh, talking about legacy of debt, and I took that as a title. I misunderstood you, and I thought I wrote down legacy of death. What can we do? <laughs> what can we do to avoid the death of Connecticut? Because what you're talking about is a hopeless spiral. Okay, I, how do I repeat that question? I don't know if everybody heard it. I, I did. I definitely meant to say, if I did not, legacy of debt. But if I said legacy of death, I sincerely apologize. Maybe that was a Freudian slip, sir. But thank you for the question. Um, I don't agree it is the death of Connecticut. I think you can make a valid argument. It is the death of Connecticut as you know it. But those are not the same thing. It becomes easy if we want to make the argument very concisely. And we say, 
Well, we can't pay. But we continue to bring in more in taxes. Again, I'm not saying that's a great thing for the economy. The problem is, what do we do with this bill? I have, I, I've, I met with one candidate for governor who, is, who lost in the primary, and this gentleman said, I am going to reduce benefits for vested state employees, vested teachers, and present day retirees. And I said, okay, sir, could you please just, so, you know, if I'm gonna write that somebody says, you know, I'm gonna move a 20,000 pound boulder, I'd like them just, can you, can you flex for me? Can you give me something? Can you help me understand? So I just said, could you please show me, forget case law, could you even show me some legal research? Has somebody, you know, Somebody a lot smarter than me done an analysis? No, there isn't any. That's a challenge, believe me, today for a journalist, because on the one hand, you don't want to be cynical, and, the, and, and at the same time, I understand how desperate people are to hear something that says, look, this legacy of debt is unfair. And by the way, please don't go home and yell at your parents or grandparents. I meant the people representing them. I told my mother this story once. She said, your father and I really didn't know that... <laughs> Connecticut was living beyond its means. And don't tell your sisters, for God's sake, they're going to be really mad. Um, but I, I think that's, that's the real challenge is unless somebody knows something that we can win in, in court, nobody has ever shown me anything other than judges are going to say, pay your bills. And what do you do when... Connecticut has this tremendous concentration of wealth. And I guarantee you, if you keep raising taxes, of course, I understand the principle, people will move and that will reduce the economy. And raising taxes will weaken the economy. Taking billions of dollars out of the economy all at one time to pay pen pension benefits when that money should have been accumulated over decades and had so it could be done gradually and waiting is gonna hurt the economy. But what's the best solution sticking with the root canal when your teeth are rotting? What else do you have for me? But there's no, I mean, there's no good root canal. There's no good fallout of a third floor window. All I can tell you to do is tuck into a ball and try to roll when you hit the ground. And if you say, I got to have a more positive solution, all I can say is take it up with gravity. So, and I don't mean to be such a, you know, a wise guy. It's just, um, I, I feel bad because all I'm doing is bringing you horrible choices and most people are saying, well, I didn't even know things had gotten this bad. But the problem is we really are limited in our options and too many people don't want to talk about, talk about it, certainly not in that context. Sorry, does anyone else have a question? I'm sorry I'm back. Uh, That's okay, no one else the, was in line in front of you. The 80 billion unfunded liabilities, is that in present value terms? And what percentage of that is for vested past employees that we just absolutely cannot touch? Roughly, roughly of that $80 billion, 50 billion of it is related to pension or retirement health care. maybe about 55, I'd have to check the most updated numbers. There are arguments that were made by the Commission on Fiscal Stability and Economic Competitiveness that a better number would be $100 billion. I didn't see how they calculated it, but what they did is they applied what they said was a more realistic assumed rate of return on our pension investments. In present value terms? Yes, sir. I, and this is more of a commentary. My guess is, frankly, given us being humans, um, the way this thing will get resolved is, is basically a federal bailout. That's what I'm guessing. Is what? A federal bailout. Okay, the gentleman said, but I'm it'll sorry. be only after incredible pain. Okay, that's that when it'll happen. Well, let, let me. Can I stop it from devolving? If anyone else wants to ask a question, please. And just if they didn't hear him, he just said he thinks the way it will ultimately get resolved is a federal bailout. And and I can't see the future. And I'm not saying you're you're right or you're wrong. What I am saying though is, it's going to be hard right now, given the overall income levels in Connecticut to make that argument right now. Now, where, where it, so, but that, doesn't that also, and I'm sorry, if we're gonna talk, I, I gotta hitch back to the mic, but 
that still begs the question then, is our only solution to watch that happen, but we're not really taking steps to mitigate a bad situation. We're still as a state basically going, no, I wanna hear something where you, you're not mitigating the, the decline. I wanna hear a growth story. And there probably is a growth story. I just, I'm telling you, I don't think it's in the next five years or in the next seven years. But if you're, if you're interested in dealing with that, you can plant the seeds now. You're having very little debate right now in Connecticut on anything other than to get you through the next two year election cycle because we have state elections every two years, governor every four, but legislature every two. Let me just quickly mention one other example. I, I made a, a comment earlier about fiscal bait and switch. When Governor Malloy and the 2014 legislature went to run for re-election in May of 2014, we had already signed into law about $235 million in tax cuts. All had one thing in common. They had all been signed in Governor Malloy's first term and they were all scheduled to begin in his second term. And when they all went home to run for re-election, the nonpartisan analyst said, when you come back, state finances are on pace to run about 7% in the red. The first new budget, first year, it's got a $1.3 billion hole. <coughs> Governor Malloy and Tom Foley both said, I will not close that deficit by raising taxes. Both said, I will deliver the tax relief on the books. Governor Malloy promised from the campaign trail about 40 million more in tax relief. Tom Foley promised over 300 million more in tax relief. The election ended, Governor Malloy won. The nonpartisan analyst came in and said, I've got some bad news and I have some good news. The bad news is the deficit didn't get any better. The good news is it didn't get any worse. It's exactly what it was when you guys went out to run on, on the campaign. $230 million in tax cuts became a $700 million tax increase, okay? If you want to count that total, that's about a $900 million swing. It was not, by the way, please do not repeat that we had the two largest tax increases in state history under Governor Malloy. I mean, just, that's simple math. They, I haven't even adjusted for inflation and the 1991 tax increase under Lowell Weicker was $1.1 billion. If you adjust that for inflation, it's over 2 billion, okay? You want to debate about 2011 and Governor Malloy, be my guest, but in fact, it's part of the quick commercial for the mayor, you'll see. Um, we have an article dispelling that, but that, that thing is, is, that's gone viral. That is just completely inaccurate, the idea that we've had the two largest, the 2015 increase by most metrics would rank fifth or sixth in the last 30 years. But anyway, that bait and switch has been going on. We have in the biennial, oh, excuse me, the bipartisan budget that was passed in November of last year, about $130 million in tax cuts. Watch them after the election. People knew when they passed them that there was a multi-billion dollar hole they had to deliver at the same time. That's like me saying, I can get $130 million to you as soon as I get past the loan shark that I owe two billion to, but if I can get around him, I'm gonna give you that money. Did I depress everyone or keep it coming? <laughs> Do we have time for any more, Helen? Okay. I, I could take a couple more, if that's okay, sure. I also left some more business cards here on the piano. I know I gave some to Helen as well. Okay. Sure. Uh, toward the end of finding solutions, could you talk a little bit about are there any choices that Weston and the other municipalities can be making at a town level that will cause changes to make Tony's job and the rest of the state government right. easier as far as finding a solution? Yeah, this, this, thank you. I don't know if everybody heard that. He asked what choices a community like Weston can make. 
And the problem is in Connecticut, most of our communities are really well managed. It's funny because the state will set local spending caps and they'll tell communities, you know, we want to have greater efficiencies. And one town official, this was said privately to me, so I won't give his name, but said that's, forget the pot, that's the black hole calling the kettle black. Um, it's ironic that the state of Connecticut is telling the towns what they can do. Unfortunately, I think mostly what's going to happen is going to be, in theory, choices, but actually it's, it's going to be decisions forced upon you. I think as municipal aid shrinks, first what will go will be non-education aid because of the chef lawsuit, heck, going back all the way to Horton versus Meskel, Connecticut is not going to touch ECS, I think, in huge numbers. I do think wealthier communities will start to see some ECS cuts. But for the most part, it's ECS. I'm sorry, I apologize, folks. Education cost sharing is the, I'm falling into acronyms, that's the single largest municipal grant. That's about $2 billion in a $3 billion municipal aid program. Um, okay, uh, every community gets some education cost sharing. Um, but I do think what will happen as that money goes is the choice will be if you have the money to add it, uh, to replace it with local property taxes. I mean, again, this legacy of debt has been leeching resources out of everything. Why are people going to UConn and community colleges and the state university system paying more and more? The state is pulling back and saying, you guys can make a choice. We're going to charge you more, and if you want to go, go. And so now we've got more and more people, and now I'm slipping into wealth inequality, who are not going to school or are graduating from school with massive debt that they can't pay off. And you get this... A downward spiral going on and it's weakening in the economy. Um, I think after that what goes is education aid and we start we start whittling that down. At some point we will have to have a discussion about and it's again it, I get it it's incredibly unpleasant. We're talking about a shift in the state of Connecticut or excuse me we're talking in this room about a shift in the state of Connecticut. Most people are still telling you don't worry, we're going to grow our way out of this. It would be great if we could grow our way out of it. I just would invite you to say, well, tell me specifically, how much growth do you anticipate and how big are our bills? And then listen if you hear a single number in that conversation. Yes, sir. Um, so Connecticut uh, issues debt uh, roughly in line with some of the other uh, credit challenge states. Um, yet, according to your numbers, the per capita debt in this state is far in excess of the average. I don't know how it compares on a per capita basis to Illinois and New Jersey and some of the other. Uh, but the, the question is, um, do you know, based upon discussions with analysts at the rating agencies, um, why it is that they issue ratings that allow us to continue to issue debt at these levels? And are there any triggers that they are looking for that would be uh, a catalyst for them to change their ratings? Thank you. Um, I don't know if everybody heard that. This gentleman just asked, and I'm, I'm just paraphrasing, why are the rating agencies not perhaps being more vocal um, as as Connecticut continues to build up its debt. I want to just correct one thing, though. When, I, when, you, when you mentioned about the per capita debt, we were literally talking just about the per capita pension debt. But your point is still valid because Connecticut's bonded debt is also among the highest per capita in the nation. Um, I, it would be speculative on my part as to why Moody's and S&P and Fitch and Kroll are not speaking up loudly. You are starting to see more and more, though, Connecticut's bond rating continues to be reduced across the board. We're starting to see more and more the bond ratings of our municipalities, particularly in the cities, going down, and it is driving up costs. And we've already been using our debt in ways I think nobody here would disagree is inefficient. We have been borrowing over $100 million a year for most of the Malloy administration to make payments on borrowing. We had a problem with our cash flow in 2000 and 
13, and we borrowed half a billion dollars. At the same time, we borrowed another $40 million to make the first two years of debt payments on the half a billion so the governor and legislature wouldn't have to deal with the costs until after they won re-election. And Governor Malloy followed a pattern that Governor Rell did because as she was leaving office, she borrowed a billion dollars to cover the last operating debt she had, even though we still had a billion three in the bank. And she borrowed the money to cover the last couple payments on that billion dollars. Sorry to throw all those numbers at you. Believe me, the state of Connecticut has in a lot of ways been become a state about how do I shift costs from one election cycle to the next. You can't do that much damage and unravel it easily. The problem is when I talk to people who work on the campaigns for both parties, they say what you're saying, nobody could say and get elected. So I joke at these, I say, well, I'm announcing my candidacy for, you know, go to Keith Faniff at notachanceinhell.com. <laughs> and that's, you know, that's where I'm announcing my campaign for dog catcher because that's, you know, the only chance I could get. Uh, yes, miss. Okay. To try and summarize, if, if Connecticut needs to make a culture shift, for clarity, we've gotten into a lot of this pain by contractual obligations. And for example, you compared Rhode Island statutory obligations. What is the state of present day benefits? Because we have to remediate the past. We also want to ensure we don't make the same mistakes going sure. forward. So are these benefits at this point still being contractually provided to the teachers and the retirees, to, et cetera, today? Or is there, what are the legal arguments, and I have my own theories on this, right. were there legal arguments for shifting them from a contractual basis to a statutory basis? Okay, that, did everyone hear that question? I'll, 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 that was something I really should have brought up. Thank you so much for that question. Basically, and I'm gonna do my best to paraphrase, but this lady asked, what can we do sort of to get out first and foremost out of this contractual entanglement? And we keep getting caught in, in a catch-22. We had a contract that ran through 2012 with, excuse me, I'm sorry, 2017 with the state employees. That was the benefits contract that said, every new state employee is eligible to be enrolled in a pension program. Every new state employee is eligible to be enrolled in a retirement health care program. And in 2011, six years before that contract was set to expire, Governor Malloy took office, he came to the unions, and he said, I would like a couple of years of a wage freeze, I would like some new restrictions on health care, higher co-pays. I'd like some new restrictions on your pension benefits. And they said, great, done. But we want you to add five years to that contract. So now you're locked into offering a pension to every new hire through 2022. And the state of Connecticut said, OK. Because we took that, I mean, you could, you could make an argument without taking sides. Listen, maybe we shouldn't be keeping this pension system, but we wanted the savings first, so we took it. And if you don't want the savings, don't lie to yourself. The only way to avoid, to decline, to say the unions, no thank you, we can't afford to give you another extension. In 2017, we're getting out of the pension business would have been to raise taxes more than we already did because the bill collector was at the door. There were gimmick proposals. There was one proposal to sell Bradley International Airport and prop up another chunk of state government on $700 million of one-time money. But the only realistic solution, the only one that was mathematically honest, was you would have had to bite the bullet and things would have to have gotten worse before they got better. But instead, we said, okay, we'll give you the five more years, we'll extend it to 2022, and now we'll take the concessions. Last year, 2017, the state decides it needs more concessions. 
Same thing happens and the union go, you got it. But now the contract goes to 2027, five more years. And we said, okay. The part where this gets intellectually dishonest is some people go, oh, that was a horrible deal. And that can make a very valid argument. I, I can make a very valid argument why it's not. But if you're not gonna do that deal, and you're saying, oh, but I don't have to raise taxes, make them show you how they're gonna pay the bills. Because they're only telling you half the story. To say I could turn out that deal and I don't have to raise taxes is like me telling you about the movie Old Yeller and leaving out that he gets shot at the end. <laughs> so what happened is we've been caught in this cycle of we'll take the short-term burst of money from the unions extending a system that we're having trouble paying for. And there's one last problem. If you get rid of the pension system, it still gets worse before it gets better. We rely heavily right now on the contributions, the pension contributions of today's workers to, to, pay, to pay the benefits of today's retirees. If I start hiring state employees tomorrow with a 401k, I sure can't make them pay into the pension system. So you have to be ready to start picking up that part of the cost. With the teacher's pension, you could do that. You could get rid of it earlier. And after 2024, you can start changing how you um, save for it. You could pass a bill, by the way, tomorrow saying new teachers, new teachers don't get a pension. I'm not saying you should or shouldn't, but ask yourself this. Find me one candidate for any office who will stand up today and say, we should create a new retirement tier for municipal school teachers. New hires should not get a pension. They will make something up. They should get a 401k and social security. Find one candidate from either party. I've asked all the candidates for governor. Nobody's ready to propose that. Why not? because they all know that's a political hornet's nest and nobody's ready to chuck a rock at that one. But if, if that's not a better note to end on, I don't know. 